Hi, everybody. So I received a comment that I recorded a couple of videos earlier trying to find a way to discuss this that was kind and I kind of ran out of space because I don't know that there is a kind way to address some of the stuff that is going on on YouTube. I wish that people had to qualify somehow to be teachers on YouTube, especially of the Bible. If there was a subject matter that people should have to be qualified to teach, it should be the Bible. Because this affects so substantially the lives of people. And when I say this, it could be up to and including the eternal life of people. There is not a weightier subject matter that one could venture out into teaching and get so wrong. I don't have it in me. I do not have the emotional bandwidth to venture out into YouTube because I know that I'm going to encounter things that are going to make me angry. So I just avoid it. So I don't know what other people are saying. I don't know what weird ideas are out there. And I don't know how many people are being misled. Part of that is me wanting to remain willfully ignorant about the number of people being misled because otherwise it would break my heart. Especially for these channels who have tens of thousands of subscribers who, at the click of a button, could hear something and believe something that is patently false and it could negatively impact their spiritual lives as a result. To be honest, that just makes me sick. So I'm grateful for opportunities to clarify certain things, especially things that are significantly, should be significantly basic. They aren't, clearly, but they should be. And this is where we just need to open a Bible online and do a search for words and find context. But people don't do that because it's easier to click the link of somebody else who they assume did research and listen to someone they assume knows what they're talking about because they assume they did research when neither one of those things is true. So I'm grateful for the opportunity to address this. I wish that I didn't have to, but I'm going to. One of my subscribers, I think a new one, so hello and welcome, Alicia, says I'm having a hard time understanding the New Covenant slash New Testament meanings now. This isn't the first time. From what I've heard and started to believe is that the New Covenant is for Israel during the millennial reign, and the church isn't under the New Covenant, but rather heirs of the New Testament because of the inheritance from Jesus Christ. I'm going to stop right there. I had never heard this before. If you want to learn things that should, learn thoughts that should never exist, just go on YouTube and hop on people's channels and you will be welcomed into a world of crap. I've never heard this for good reason. It's whoever taught this is teaching this should be locked out of YouTube permanently, and I wish I could just go disable channels. People probably think that of mine too, but I sometimes I wish I had that power to just shut people up off YouTube. Go away. Like, end your channel. You're not doing anyone any good if this is what you teach. So there were two people that she named as teaching this, and I went on YouTube and just did a quick little thing. And there's a whole bunch of videos from people saying, don't listen to these people because they're wrong. Well, clearly, if that's what they're teaching. The first thing that came to mind when I thought about this was, first of all, from what I've heard and started to believe is that the new covenant is for Israel during the millennial reign. 
Israel will have been brought into new covenant prior to the millennial reign because that's how they get into the kingdom, which is where the millennial reign occurs. So they have to be brought into new covenant before they get into the kingdom to be there physically for during the millennial reign. It's a cause and effect, a sequence of events. If this, then this. They can't be in the millennial reign if they're not in new covenant. Because a precondition for being in the kingdom where the millennial reign will occur is having been brought into new covenant. So then the other statement is, and the church isn't under new covenant, but rather heirs of the New Testament because of the inheritance from Jesus Christ. Okay, what is an inheritance? We can't be heirs to something intangible. The new covenant is intangible because it is faith-based. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. So you can't be heir to something that is faith-based. You have to be heir to something that is tangible, and inheritance is tangible. The end result of our faith is glorification, which produces a new body. That is a tangible result. That is where our eternal life is housed in our new body, which is immortal and incorruptible. The reason, the reason that we get to the day of glorification is because we met our day of justification prior. That is the day upon which we were sealed by the Holy Spirit, by grace through faith, and brought into a new covenant relationship with Christ in order to meet the day of glorification at a later point, because Romans 8 says, those who he justified them he also glorified. So if A then B, and B will occur prior to our entrance into the kingdom. The new covenant is the golden ticket into the kingdom. It does not occur in the kingdom. It occurs prior to the kingdom and grants you entrance into the kingdom as a result. In John 10, Jesus calls himself the door. He says, I am the door. Whoever enters through him, uh, that's a synonymous with going through him to get into the kingdom, the open door. It's an open door, closed door conversation. The door is shut on people who are denied access somewhere. The somewhere in view is the kingdom. So if the door is closed, that means they are not justified. That means that there is no day of glorification in sight and there is no kingdom entry in sight. When we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and are saved, we go through the open door that is Christ into the kingdom with irrevocable citizenship. The new covenant isn't the end goal. It's the ticket into the kingdom. It is the relationship that we come into with Christ, the covenant relationship that we come into with Christ. Christ, who was guaranteed these things that we shall then share on account of being co-heirs. But again, we go back to the root word of heir inheritance or the, the root of this issue. We can't inherit the new covenant. The new covenant is a faith-based intangible idea. It is a way to inherit what is tangible, and that is kingdom, kingdom citizenship in a glorified body, tangible. So the tangible thing that is being inherited is our place in the kingdom, the earthly kingdom, the millennial reign, where he will rule and reign from, and we shall share said rule and reign for a thousand years. This was the first part where I'm like, well, hey, wait on, or hey, hold on, wait a second. You can't inherit an intangible concept. The new covenant is an intangible concept. We are brought into new covenant based on an intangible concept, which is grace through faith. Christ performed the work on the cross so that we profess faith in his intangible new covenant we are then guaranteed tangible promises as a result. The end goal is not new covenant. That is the way by which we receive and become co-heirs to get inheritance. And how and where we get that is in the kingdom. So what I'm going to do is substantiate that the 
inheritance is the kingdom. The inheritance is not the new covenant. The inheritance is the kingdom, and the new covenant is the way by which we receive the inheritance. We become heirs to the inheritance when we are brought into new covenant relationship by grace through faith in the finished work of Christ on the cross. She says, I could be totally in error, and I am fine with that. I just want to know the truth so I am not misguided. This is the precise reason that I have such an issue with these unqualified teachers teaching on YouTube, because they lack empathy. I don't know what goes on in the mind of these people who are trying to gain subscribers on these channels and throw up videos and, and teach stuff like this. It can't possibly be motivated by agape, which is a servant-focused, other-focused, sacrificial love, because the sacrifice there is spending the time, effort, energy. It's giving of the limited resources that these people have in order to learn the truth before they can teach the truth. If you haven't taken the time to learn it, then what are you doing trying to teach it? I have an issue with this because I cannot stand the fact that people think so little of other people that they are not willing to invest the necessary resources to learn the subject matter before they throw up a YouTube channel and try to teach it. Because this is the result. And people come to me with these questions, which I am so happy to be able to answer. But that never should have been asked in the first place because there shouldn't be people teaching this stuff. And yet there are. That's what bothers me. Not that I'm perfect, not that I have everything right. That's not the point. The point is, I care enough about you guys to learn the subject matter as thoroughly as I possibly can before I open my mouth. You have to learn before you teach. <laughs> ah, it bothers me. So anyway, there are some scriptures that speak about God's covenant with Israel and the house of Judah. Yes, Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 36, Hebrews 8, Zechariah 8. Israel will eventually be brought into new covenant relationship. It's not that they have a different covenant with God than we do. That borders on dual covenant theology where people think that Israel will be saved on account of being Israel. No, John the Baptist made that very clear in Matthew 3 before Jesus even began his ministry. He says, O ye generation of vipers! to the Pharisees and the Sadducees who thought they were special exactly for being seed of Abraham, natural seed of Abraham, descendants of Abraham. He says, no, he says, think not to say within yourself, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you, God is able of these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Abraham was promised to have descendants that numbered as the sands of the sea, the stars of the sky, the dust of the earth, innumerable. It would be nothing for God to raise up natural seed to Abraham. That's what he's saying. He said, think not to say within yourself, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you, it's easy for God to raise up seed of Abraham, natural seed of Abraham. He says, now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit, and doesn't have the Holy Spirit, is hewn down and cast into the fire. He says, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he who cometh after me, whose shoes I am not worthy to lose, he will baptize you with fire and with the Holy Ghost. Whose fan is in his hand, he will thoroughly purge his floor, gather his wheat into the garner, garner, he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So that's talking about up, and, up to and including Judgment Day. People who are not with him, eventually, meaning being brought into new covenant relationship, are going to be excluded from the kingdom. The door will be closed to them, and they're going to wind up in the lake of fire. The people who are his, who believe by grace through faith, which is what that was leading to, people professing faith in Christ, would be brought into new covenant relationship, which Israel will be during the 70th week. That is the outcome of Daniel's 70th week, is bringing a remnant of Israel to saving faith in Christ to go into the kingdom and populate it in their natural bodies. The rest of us will have been glorified prior to that point. So it's not that Israel will not be brought into New Covenant relationship. They will. But the New Covenant is not for them expressly, not specifically. It is for everyone. She says, I have been believing for about four years now that the New Covenant is not the Everlasting Covenant. Okay, Everlasting Covenant is not that. 
the new covenant is an everlasting covenant. There are references in the Old Testament to everlasting covenant. That is an entirely separate conversation. When you are talking about new covenant and old covenant, you are talking about Exodus 19 through Matthew 28. That's old covenant. And then uh, Matthew 27. Then Jesus died on the cross. He shut up the old covenant permanently and transitioned it immediately with his death and shed blood on the cross to the new covenant, which will be everlasting because there is no end. There's two covenants in the Bible specifically related to how the Bible is sectioned. Old Testament, Old Covenant, New Testament, New Covenant. And the great divider between covenants and the great equalizer between people is the cross. The Old Covenant was for Israel alone. The Gentiles were never invited to participate in Old Covenant relationship with Christ. Christ went to the cross, permanently shut it up, and immediately upon his resurrection, the next thing we see in Matthew 28 is him giving the Great Commission to his 12, his 11 at that time, his uh, apostles saying, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, Gentiles and Jews alike, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. From that point forward, from the time that the new covenant was instituted with the death and shed blood of Christ on the cross, there will never be a transition to another covenant. It is new covenant, and everyone who comes to Christ through faith will be brought into immediately at the point of justification, at the point of belief, at the point of the sealing of the Holy Spirit, be brought into new covenant relationship with Christ. Forward looking eventually to their day of glorification where they will receive the eternal life through a glorified body. People say, well, eternal life is an intangible concept, and we were promised that through faith. No, eternal life is a very tangible concept because it comes with a new body. They're very tangible. Very tangible. And it comes with the promise of inheritance at the point of justification. Like I said, we're going to talk about that, but I want to get through this comment first. She said, I've been believing for about four years now that the new covenant is not the everlasting covenant. It is an everlasting covenant. There are other everlasting covenants described in scripture. Different contexts. We're not going to go through that in this video. Old covenant, new covenant, is it excludes that conversation. So don't be confused about that. Like I said, that's an entirely separate conversation. Um... But she says that the Old Covenant New Covenants are specifically between God and Israel. No. The Old Covenant was between God and Israel. And then Jesus went to the cross, shut it up, died for the transgressions under the First Covenant, which is the Old Covenant, and then immediately with his death and shed blood on the cross began the Second Covenant or the New Covenant and invited everyone to participate by grace through faith. Every single person who has come to Christ since his death is brought into New Covenant relationship with Christ. Hands down, bar none. The people who died prior to Christ's death, who believed in him, are Old Testament saints. And they have their own resurrection at the end of the 70th week, as specifically noted in Isaiah 26 and Daniel 12, 2. Everyone who came to Christ after his death, specifically after his resurrection, are New Covenant believers. And there is a sequence of resurrections buckets that they could fall in depending on when they come to Christ. If we come to Christ between his resurrection and the day of the rapture, then we go in the rapture. That is our day of glorification. We're taken to heaven to bypass the seven years of the 70th week. People who have not come to Christ prior to that, that stopping point, but come to Christ in the 70th week, between the beginning and the ending of the 70th week, will be resurrected to a glorified body at the end of the 70th week to go into the kingdom. Regardless, we now and they then shall share the rule with Christ in the kingdom for a thousand years. The kingdom is the inheritance. So what I did here, now that we've gotten to this conversation, where I wanted to bring us to proving that the inheritance is not the new covenant, the inheritance is the kingdom, 
is to isolate the word inheritance in the New Testament specifically. So the first ones here, I would encourage you to look at these parables side by side. Matthew 21, this is after the triumphal entry. This is after the king came to bring the kingdom to Israel and they rejected him. And he told the parable to the Pharisees. He's like, what would you do if this happened? If the one coming to bring the kingdom, the heir to the kingdom, came to bring it, and they put him to death instead to take what was his away from him. What is his? We'll come to that. Mark 12, Luke 12, Luke 20, these things talk about the same thing. Um, Acts 20. Now, brethren, I commend you to God and the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. What would be the inheritance among all them which are sanctified? Acts 26. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Okay? So here he's differentiating the forgiveness of sins, which is justification, which is the point at which we are brought into new covenant with Christ, from the inheritance. Clearly, justification and being brought into new covenant relationship are not the inheritance because he's saying there are two different things in Acts 26, 18. Galatians 3 gives us more clarity on what this could be. For if the inheritance be of the law, talking about under the old covenant, then it is no more of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. So the inheritance was a promise given to Abraham. What were the promises given to Abraham? Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Promised land promise, natural seed promise, spiritual seed promise, which is Christ. Essentially, that boils down to the promised land, which is where the kingdom will be. So he gave him the promise of the kingdom. He gave him the promise of Abraham having descendants that number as the sands of the sea, the stars of the sky, the dust of the earth, innumerable, which came to fruition through both Ishmael and Isaac. And, most importantly, he gave him the promise of the Redeemer coming through his line. So, we begin to narrow down what the inheritance is when we know it was given to Abraham. And we are, those who are of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham, is what Galatians 3.8 says. So, we are heirs of the promise because of our faith. Okay? Well, that would be faith in the promised seed who was promised to come through the line of Abraham, the third part of those, the third of those three promises given to Abraham. We're not part of the natural seed. We're part of the spiritual seed when we, when we profess faith in the finished work of Christ on the cross and are thus brought into new covenant relationship. So the only other thing left for us to constitute inheritance would be related to the promised land. Ephesians 1.14, justification is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. Well, the redemption of the purchased possession is synonymous with the day of glorification, which is the day upon which we are taken to the kingdom while it is still in heaven. So justification is the down payment. Glorification is the reception. It's the day we go into the kingdom. It's the day we receive our eternal inheritance. Ephesians 1.18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory be his inheritance of his inheritance in the saints. Okay, so that's talking about Jesus' inheritance, not ours, but Jesus's. Because you have to remember that we are co-heirs. The inheritance that we get is, a, is on account of being co-heirs with Christ. So the inheritance was originally promised to him, and he's sharing it with us. We are not the primary recipients. We are the secondary recipients because the grace of God is sharing it with us. So the inheritance is his, and we are co-heirs. means we're going to get it too. 
That's where the ruling and reigning with him comes in, as was promised in the letter to the church of Thyatira in Revelation 2. Co-heirs means what? Means joint heirs. Promised to rule in the ages to come, because what is in the ages to come? The kingdom. That is what he was promised. The kingdom. And the people in the kingdom. Ephesians 5. For you know that no whoremonger, nor unclean, nor a covetous man, or a, who is an idolater, hath any inherent inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. That's where inheritance comes to fruition, is in the kingdom. You can take note of the rest of these verses, but... Just know that look up inheritance and it'll continue to put in context what the inheritance is, the kingdom. James 2.5 makes this abundantly clear. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? The promise of inheritance is not the new covenant. The new covenant is the means by which we obtain our inheritance, which is the kingdom of God. I'm going to take us through the Psalms real quick. Locate the one. Psalm 2. Ask of me. I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, talking to Jesus, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. What's his inheritance? The people in the kingdom and the earth for the kingdom. Uh, where am I looking? Sorry, I just... Psalm 94, 14. For the Lord will not cast off his people, talking about Israel, neither will he forsake his inheritance. That's saying the same thing twice. Saying unto thee, I will give the land of Canaan the lot of your inheritance. The promised land, promised to Abraham, that those who are of faith will participate, partake of, on account of being blessed with faithful Abraham. There was one... Oh, and inherit the, I'm like, there's one thing that's not showing up. Let me find it. I'll be right back. Okay, here we go. Psalm 25, 13, his soul shall dwell at ease and his seed shall inherit the earth. The promised seed is Christ and we are seeds of Abraham on account of our faith in Christ. Blessed with faithful Abraham. So the inheritance is the earth. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. This is what Peter tells us. We're a holy nation, a peculiar people, that we should show forth the praises of him who hath called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. The people whom he hath chosen for his inheritance. This is also Israel, mine inheritance. What does he say in the Beatitudes, Matthew 5? The meek shall inherit the earth, but the meek shall inherit the earth, shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. That's the everlasting covenant, is the covenant of peace. Let's keep looking. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever. Wait on the Lord, keep his way, he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. Psalm 82, 8. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations, the people and the land. The people are the righteous who will inhabit the kingdom, who are also going to inherit the kingdom. The inheritance is not the new covenant. The new covenant is the way by which we obtain our inheritance in the kingdom. Irrevocable citizenship in the kingdom of God. This is what the letter to the church of Philadelphia is all about. So I appreciate this question. I don't like that it had to be asked because there are people out there teaching blatant falsehood. 
but I appreciate that it was asked so that I can clarify it. If you have further questions about this, please let me know. What is our inheritance? Kingdom. It's all about the kingdom.